the first video, I looked at ego states, metaphors for different styles of thinking, feeling and behaving. I touched on controlling, nurturing, adapted and freestyles, referred to in TA as parent and child, and contrasted them with the adult. I'll be going a little deeper into the scope of these styles in a moment. I also looked at complementary transactions, where the styles of thought and behaviour between two people meet each other to produce a stable dynamic and cross transactions where the respective styles conflict to produce unstable dynamics. In this video I'll be looking at games and introducing the split transaction. But first a little more on ego states. There's huge scope for all kinds of child and parent behaviour here. Taking the parent state, on initial viewing it might seem controlling is negative and nurturing is positive, but let's look closer. Controlling can cover some very negative traits like bossy, autocratic, fault finding and dismissive. But it can also lead to positive experiences, where structure and direction is needed. Criticism can be given in constructive, considerate ways. Nurturing might seem positive when it's expressed in support, compassion and care, but it can also be smothering, stifling and overprotective, and end up feeling more critical than nurturing. The same with the adapted and free child styles. In free mode, we can be egocentric and selfish, wild and inconsiderate, but we could be creative, playful, curious. Adaptive mode refers to how we've changed ourselves in response to rules laid down by authority. On the negative side, we might have learned to be compliant, fearful, anxious or helpless. Or we might have adapted other behaviours, going against the rules, becoming rebellious and anti-conformist. On the positive side, adaptation can help us get along with other humans by observing reasonable conventions. Of course, with all of these factors, there are degrees. Take compliance, like every factor here. It can range from weak to strong. Compliance can be expressed in many ways. It can be passive, reacting to people's wishes, or anticipatory, predicting people's wishes. The scope of human behaviour here is vast, which is great news for dealing with games. Rather than being locked into two or three fixed responses, there's huge room for creativity and individuality. Here's a scenario. Person A says they have some problem. Person B starts suggesting solutions. One by one, person A rejects every single one of them, giving a reason why each solution wouldn't work. B eventually runs out of ideas. A quips, well, you're a great help. This is a classic game, known in TA as the Why Don't You Yes But game. In his book, Games People Play, TA's founder, Eric Byrne, outlined many such games. So why is it a game? Well, because what was being said didn't match what was going on psychologically. On the surface, from their conversation, it might be thought that A was looking for help and B was offering it. But underneath, A didn't want help at all. What A actually wanted was attention and justification of her own inaction. What was going on with the ego states here? Well, on the social level, it looked like adult-adult. B was offering reasonable, practical adult suggestions and A was pointing out reasonable, practical flaws. But beneath that, on the psychological level, A's coming from a helpless, victim-y child position, and B's responding to that tug by adopting a rescuing parent style. This is what's known as a split transaction, reflecting the split between surface appearances and ulterior motives. A brings the game to an end, changing to a critical parent, with B changing to helpless child. This change of states at the end of a game is known as the switch. The switch is followed by what's known as the cross-up, a period of disorientation when the target of the game realises they've just been had. Now come the payoffs, with the game's instigator feeling justified and superior, while B feels de-skilled and foolish. Games can be played to different degrees. TA proposes three broad levels. First degree games are the mildest forms, and feel acceptable in the player's social group. Players in second degree games prefer to distance themselves from the game, and don't share it with people they know. Third degree games can lead to injury, death and criminal charges. Some suggest there's a fourth degree, played through politics affecting communities, nations and the planet. TA suggests all parties in games are active participants and sees the initiator's target not as a powerless victim but as a very engaged player. To reflect that idea, TA assigns names to the contributions of the respective players. Player A initiates a game with a con, an invitation in the form of a split transaction. For a game to proceed effectively, player B must accept the con on both levels. By doing this, in TA terms, B reveals their gimmick, some kind of need that B has, which A can exploit. It could be a need for approval, or to seem wise or superior, or even inferior. By the way, we now have all the components of the TA Games formula. 
A game is defined as a combination of a con plus a gimmick, leading to a series of exchanges or responses between the players, which form the bulk of the game. Then finally to a switch, a cross up and the payoff. Stephen Cartman provided another way to conceptualize games in his famous drama triangle, employing the three dramatic roles of victim, persecutor and rescuer. Transferring the why don't you yes but game to this format, we have A starting out as victim and B as rescuer. The switch comes when A and B change roles, with A becoming persecutor to B's victim. Why do we play games? Well, there's the prospect of meeting mutual needs, the instigator through the con and the target through their gimmicks. Another reason is simply attention. If someone's hungry for attention, they'll seek it out. And in the absence of positive attention, negative attention is still better than none at all. Drama provides a potentially endless supply of attention as players perpetuate the conflict, switching from persecutor to hard done by victim and back again. A third idea is that games affirm what TA calls our life position. TA suggests that through the influence of our environment and upbringing, we can find ourselves taking a broad stance in our relationships with other people. We can take a position of equality with our fellow humans, or I'm okay, you're okay, or a depressive position, putting ourselves below others, an arrogant position, putting others below us, or a futile position, putting everyone down. TA suggests we like to justify these positions to ourselves, even where they distort reality, and we choose the games that confirm our own basic position. How can we put all of this to use in detecting and exiting games? Well, a point I'd like to emphasize first, which applies to the whole series. Most of us have probably come across those twee training videos on relationships or assertiveness, which show someone using a prescribed technique to stand up to a bully or a manipulative co-worker. And in response, the abuser graciously backs down, admitting they were unreasonable, and gets magically transformed into a cheerful, cooperative human being. We all know life isn't like that. People who've enjoyed a superior position in an unequal relationship don't give it up so easily. They'll most often persist or even escalate their abuse. People's tenacity in game playing varies hugely, and sometimes it's impossible to shift the interaction into a positive, fair exchange. With that in mind, here are some of the options TA presents in dealing with games. Games often seem to be over before you're even aware you've played one, because we can get lost in the moment. So before the game begins, really try and deconstruct what happens. How does it start? Who starts it? What happens in the game? What kinds of feelings do you experience? How does it end? Awareness of these factors can later alert you to the fact you're in a game. Consider what needs of yours are being hooked into. If there's a need for approval, can you risk disapproval? If there's a need to feel understood, faced with someone determined to misunderstand you no matter what you say, can you allow yourself to let go of that need? Gimmicks will be explored in more depth later in the series. Look out for discounts. And this doesn't mean a reduction in your bills. In TA, discounts refer to statements that distort or deny some aspect of reality. That painting's rubbish is a discount. Claiming the painting is objectively worthless. I don't like that painting is not. Games always entail some kind of discount. Due to the split nature of gamey transactions, there's often a characteristically slippery feel to them. For instance, maybe someone's trying to come across as your friend while actually putting you down. That slippery feel can be a warning. If you become aware that you're in a game, there are various options to consider. You could share your awareness of the game with the other player and invite them to step out of it with you. Respond from adult. Taking the original why don't you yes but scenario, the parent component here shows itself in B's assumption that he can think of solutions A hasn't thought of. Take that parent component away and let's see what we're left with. Here, B gives A credit for finding her own solutions. A now has no ideas to reject. You could respond from different states than the one the game seems to invite. This refers back to the negative and positive aspects of the parent and child discussed earlier. Here are four examples of alternative ego responses to the why don't you yes but game. The negative controlling parent delivers a dismissive persecuting rebuke. The positive controlling parent challenges A's initial discount that the task is impossible and directs A to give it a go in an encouraging way. The negative nurturing parent leaps in to rescue, and this is the most likely to cross over into why don't you, yes but. The positive nurturing parent is willing to help, but invites A to give the direction. In this way, A retains responsibility for the problem. If someone's determined to persist, despite reasonable responses and the repeated communication of boundaries, the best move might be to just flat out unplug from them. 
there's little to be gained by reasoning with people who are stuck in a dramatic role. This video has touched on some of TA's ideas about games. In the next video, I'll take a closer look at gimmicks.